Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome to, uh, you all to the second day of our GLEX 2017 with another series of interesting keynote lectures, plenaries, and other events. For a great start of this day, please welcome our first two speakers of today. First, Mr. Rob Chambers, the Orion Program Production Lead, and Daniela Ricci, Human Spaceflight Advanced Program, both from Lockheed Martin, and they will present you the Lockheed Martin's plans for human exploration of the solar system. So, Rob, thank you. So why do we explore? I think there's probably more answers to that question than we have people in the room. We all have our own reasons that we want to explore the solar system. For Lockheed Martin, it's always been about the science and the discovery. We've been fortunate enough to work with NASA for many decades and have explored and supported the exploration of every planet in the solar system. Plus Pluto, whether you regard that as a planet or not, a dwarf planet. We built every re-entry heat shield for the Mars missions over the years, uh, and, and for us, it's been about the science from the get-go. You know, John Rumsfeld, who was the... Okay, there we go, thank you. So, so John Rumsfeld was the uh, recent Associate Administrator for NASA, for the Science Mission Director, and so I've shamelessly stolen his three questions, which to us evoke the true mystery and what we want to accomplish in exploring our solar system. And, and those three questions, where did we come from, where are we going, and are we alone? Where did we come from is sort of obvious, the benefit of that, understanding how the planets were formed, how do the moons of Mars affect Mars' history, what does that hold in store for us, and what does it tell us about the potential for habitable worlds outside our solar system? The search for life, are we alone? Fairly obvious, right? And I think, uh, was it Isaac Asimov that said, whether I find that there's life out there or I find that there's no other life out there, either one of those is an absolutely amazing discovery. But the third one here, where are we going? Hopefully most of you understand or know that this isn't a Hollywood picture. This is a NASA rendering of what we think Mars looked like back in the day, and what it looks like today, of course. And whether it had life or not, we don't know. But certainly it had running water, it had an atmosphere. It was a very habitable and temperate world. Once the magnetic field was lost, and the atmosphere was stripped off molecule by molecule, it's resulted in the desolate wasteland we have today. What does it mean for us here on Earth? Do we understand the geological processes of our solar system? These are fundamental questions that affect every man and woman on the planet Earth, and it's why we explore. To answer the three questions that Rob just brought up, NASA's commissioned us to construct the first deep space exploration vehicle, Orion. Orion's comprised of three systems, the launch port system, the crew module, and the service module. You can see the launch board system in the middle of the slide. In case of an emergency, Within milliseconds of an issue, it launches the crew away from the spacecraft. The crew module is the shiny conical piece, and it provides the crew with life support, a pressurized vehicle, and command and control. The service module is created by the European Space Agency. It provides power, propulsion, and the consumables necessary to sustain the crew. Oxygen, nitrogen, and water. You can see in the upper right-hand photo a successful paddleboard test displaying our launch board system. Again, we tested the Orion system in 2014. You can see the two photos on the right showing a successful mission out to the Van Allen belts and back. In order to make the crew successful on their mission to beyond Earth orbit, we need four to five, to five times more oxygen, food, water, and carbon dioxide, and about twice as much propellant. One of the key aspects to Orion is the heat shield and the redundancy provided by the system. 
The reentry speeds are much higher coming in from outside the Earth orbit, and the heat shield needs to be able to sustain these high temperatures to keep the crew alive. As the only vehicle built from the ground up for deep space human exploration above our solar system, Orion is the linchpin, as you'll see, for the exploration initiatives, not just for NASA, but for all of humanity. These hardware products are in development today. We're going to talk a little bit about EM1 and EM2 and our mid-altitude asset support mission coming up here in a moment. But we're about 40% of the way through that test program. We had the Petaport 1 test that Danielle just referred to and EFT1, which tested out the crew module and its parachute and reentry systems. So we got sort of the hard part out of the way. What we're focused on now is Exploration Mission 1, which will be the first test of that combined vehicle the Orion capsule and the European Space Agency European Service Module, shown here on the right. And we talked a lot yesterday, and it was wonderful to talk about the, the international collaboration for human exploration. Human exploration transcends a single corporation or a single agency or a single nation, partly because of the goal is benefiting all of mankind, but also the effort that has to go into it, the challenges, both technical and programmatic and financial, require bringing the international community together to combine the skill and the will of the planet Earth to perform these explorations. And that's shown in evidence no better than with the European Service Module, which is being supplied to us from ESA as part of the ISS continuation of effort and collaboration. So you can see here on the right, the European Service Module that's being developed in Bremen, Germany, by Airbus, who's our prime contractor there, with uh, support, of course, from all of the nations uh, that support the ESA initiatives. The bottom there is the EM1 heat shield. That's the actual heat shield that I, I noted earlier. We have a long history of building heat shields from Mars. We've also been, uh, built the Stardust and Genesis reentry vehicles here at Earth. And next year, we're going to see a fantastic mission to the asteroid Bennu, where we're going to get a sample return. That will be returning to Earth in a capsule that is also built by Lockheed Martin and represents the third reentry system uh, for returning samples from the outer uh, parts of our solar system back here to Earth. And again, built by Lockheed. The left-hand picture, I wanted to take just a moment. We've got three vehicles already. We're getting into a production mindset for the Orion capsule. And when Christian introduced me, he referred to me as the Orion Production Strategy Lead. My day job, when I'm not coming to beautiful cities like Beijing to talk with you folks, is to figure out how we get into production of Orion. How do we reduce the cost of Orion using all of our techniques and knowledge that the human race has for large-scale production and efficient manufacturing? How do we get the annual costs down to free up funding for us to do these other things? The habitats and the land use and the deep space probes. And so you can get a taste of that because you can see our three capsules side by side in the, in the uh, Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at KSC. On the left is the structural test article. In the middle is the EM-1 Exploration Mission 1 vehicle. And on the right is the recovered EFT-1 capsule, which we're using to inform our designs. And of course, none of this happens without people, all genders, all races, working together to build the spacecraft. And that's our, our greatest asset and resource is, is the that are standing in front of the spacecraft. As Rob mentioned, we're already getting into a production mindset. You can see we're already working on exploratory mission two, even though we're deep into testing, development, and integration for exploratory mission one. On the upper right hand side, you can see one of our key human factors tests. With the crew seated during a vibration test, they're asked to operate the displays to test our software and their ability to operate during the launch, a launch and abort situation, which is critical to their success. The acceleration of this software development for Exploratory Mission 2 is one of the reasons NASA considered accelerating crew onto Exploration Mission 1. Even though they decided to go with the program of record, we're still able to say that technically it's feasible to launch crew on Exploratory Mission 1. You can see in the right-hand video, 
we're already working on machining the pressure vessel tunnel section. We're expecting to launch EM2 in 2021. This spacecraft will go out in a lunar flyby. It'll be the first mission since 1972 on Apollo 17 we've launched humans that far into space. So let's talk a little bit about Exploration Mission 1. NASA recently announced that we're moving that to early 2019. So that'll be, what, a year and a half before we're going to see that. And I want to give you a flavor of what that mission is going to accomplish. Like I said, it's a, it's a significant test of all of the systems that are required for those deep space operations, most notably the European Service Module. You'll notice that we came off after about a one or two orbits. We performed with the upper stage of the SLS vehicle a translunar injection, which will swing us out towards the moon. We do a lunar flyby, supported by the powered engine of the main engine of the vehicle, which will put us out into a distant retrograde orbit, which is uh, uh, great for cocktail parties. People will wonder what you're talking about. It's distant because it's, it's fairly significantly further than the moon, about 60,000 miles. And it's retrograde because we're so far out that the moon is rotating in the opposite direction of us. And that gives us about a two, one week or two week stay out past the moon for about 90 degrees of true anomaly. And that allows us to look at the far side of the moon, which has uh, never said it's not the dark side of the moon, but it's the far side. After about a week or two, we'll perform a deorbit burn, swing past the moon, do another powered flyby of our main engine, and swing back towards the Earth, where we'll do a skip entry. And I'm a controls and flight software guy, so bear with me for just a second. One of the cool things about Orion versus Apollo, although it looks the same from the outside, that's because physics hasn't changed much. We all have looked at deep space uh, blunt bodies and the heat shields. The thing that's unique about Orion is that we're now able to perform the calculations required to skip through the atmosphere and get further down range, which allows us to safely dispose the SM and still place the capsule just off the California coast. And that's one of the significant differences uh, between this and when we start flying through uh, now, as opposed to what we did in Apollo when they landed closer to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. On the lower right, you'll notice a small CubeSat. There are 13 CubeSats that are being launched on the upper stage of the SLS. And this reflects a real interest in NASA, the commercial sector, and in fact all of us, on getting the most out of every single mission that we send to space, whether it's a crewed mission or not. In this particular case, we've got 13 CubeSats that are going along for the ride. Small mass compared to that of Orion, but high value in terms of the science that it brings. Lockheed is, is proud to be providing one of those. It'll take infrared imagery of the far side of the moon uh, for purposes of evaluating new technologies and better understanding of the system. system. To further our knowledge of space, and especially the moon, which answers questions of how is the Earth formed, where did we come from, NASA's created a framework for deep space exploration. It starts off with the deep space gateway and transitions into the deep space transport, which we'll talk about in a bit. The deep space gateway sits in the cislunar space. This is our version of what the deep space gateway can look like. It starts off with Orion in the far right. Like we talked about, Orion provides command and control for the crew. It provides life support. It provides propulsion, communication. It's the backbone of the Deep Space Gateway when the crew are present. It also transports the crew from Earth out to the Deep Space Gateway. The habitat, which is in the middle, provides the crew with 15,000 pounds, or 6,800 kilos, and 40 kilowatts of power. This is all habitat living space and a lab for a crew or any robotic mission to provide that science that we're really now, when Orion isn't present, the habitat support vehicle at the end, the large solar arrays, provides the deep space gateway with power, solar electric propulsion, and communications. The deep space gateway doesn't need to be a complex space station. It's really just a robotic mission if the crew isn't there. 
So we're using our heritage and our knowledge to really treat this as a robotic mission. One of the key pieces to our success as um, scientists looking for you know, the vast questions of the universe versus having the support of commercial and international partners. We're going to need cargo, supplies, and then unfortunately trash disposal. So we'll be requiring cargo and logistics pods for many of our partners in order to achieve our missions. Now the crew is supposed to be there for 30 to 60 days out of the year. However, we can do any kind of science from visiting countries, commercials, commercial partners during that time period. To continue testing, we've got an EVA module. This allows us to test out our advanced EVA concepts that we'll need when we're going out to Mars. Now, Orion provides EVA capabilities, but it's not an ideal situation, so an EVA pod is really helpful in that situation. The very last piece of the Deep Space Gateway is this robotic arm that you can see. It kind of looks a lot like the arm on the space station, which is where we're borrowing all this knowledge from. This moves around elements and visiting vehicles in order to reorient the lab. You can see there's a bunch of nodes where you can hook things together, similar to Legos. This vision will eventually allow us to, per to allow for science gathered around the moon and then also sorties down to the surface of the moon if anybody wishes to. You know, that last point that Daniel made is so critical. Bill Burstenbrenner likes to talk about going to Mars, which is our horizon goal for many of us. It's not an or proposition, it's the and. It's the moon and Mars. It's America and the international community. It's government and private entities in order to pull it off. And so it's very important to understand that although we're keeping that horizon goal of Mars in view, we're going to have to test those systems out in the lunar orbit, and that's a great synergy with those that are interested, with, whether they be other nations or commercial interests in making use of the moon, the surfaces, uh, the orbital spaces, and, uh, and the L2 points, for example, for science. So let's talk a little bit about this command tech concept. You know, my grandma was a very, uh, very wise woman. She said that, uh, she said two things. She said many, many things, but there's two that I'll tell you about today. The first is that if you've got it, use it, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. One of the things is we talk a little bit about our vision for the first mission to Mars, which would be an orbital mission in our thoughts, is to make use of existing technologies. If we can combine the skill and the will of all of us to focus on the things we don't have yet and make use of the things that we do have, we can accomplish this quickly and safely. And so the heart of that is using the Orion vehicle as what we call the command deck. And there are three reasons for that. The first is safety. It's a fully developed system. We're in the final processes of integration getting ready for EM1. A lot of the software is already being developed for the displays, as you saw in the picture from Danielle a little bit ago. It will have been flight proven and it has more capability packed into that vehicle than any vehicle ever built for human exploration. From an affordability perspective, that seems fairly obvious. It's an expensive venture to create a whole new vehicle from scratch. And by making use of an existing vehicle, the multi-purpose crew exploration vehicle, that allows us to leverage the investment that's already been made both by the United States and by ESA for the service module in moving us more quickly out into the cosmos. And then finally, performance. And I want to talk with you just briefly as we walk through some of the subsystems here. As I walk through, for example, communications and navigation, most of that exists on the Orion vehicle. We don't need to add very much to the habitat itself. We leverage the Orion vehicle. And when the Orion vehicle isn't there, it's a standard deep space probe. Same thing comes to mind when you're talking command and control. There are obviously very strict rules on failure and reliability and backup systems upon backup systems and emergency mode and backup mode. All of those have been designed from the ground up in the Orion vehicle. By leveraging that while the crew is there, the habitat just has to be astronaut safe, not astronaut rated. And there's a difference between that. That means when Orion moves away, as Danielle said, the remaining vehicle is one of the deep space probes that all of us here on Earth 
have built and have demonstrated our ability to do. When it comes to the crew interfaces, this is one of my particular personal interests. We have very ruggedized avionic systems that we use for displays in the cockpit itself. It has to withstand ascent loads and entry and aborts. But you don't need that level of robustness in a habitat itself. One of the cool things about Orion is we have gigabit Wi-Fi on board, standard gigabit Wi-Fi. So we have uh, GoPro Hero 4s that we recently added to the vehicle to get ready for EM1. And uh, just able to plug that in and hook it up, integrate it fully into the flight system in a safe manner. And so leveraging those commercial capabilities allows us to use tablets and wearables to execute those habitat missions. In terms of life support, obviously, Orion has enough capabilities, as you know, for four crew for 21 days just with the Orion volume and the consumables we carry on board. But the Orion vehicle is completely capable of 1,000 day missions to Mars, as we'll talk about in a moment. So all we need out of the habitat is air circulation and additional consumables. We're able to leverage the Orion systems there. And then finally, power. Orion provides the solar arrays and the battery is required to keep the habitat going while we have the crew there for all of the science activities and the additional load uh, when the crew is there. When it's not there, that habitat support vehicle and provides the power necessary just to keep the station alive for those other 11 months out of the year when we can use it as an uncrewed base for science. So, the command deck of the future. So one of the things I talked about a few slides ago was the Deep Space Gateway. This is our vision of what the Deep Space Transport can look like, Mars Base Camp. You'll see very similar elements, which Rob will walk through in a few charts. But to achieve the horizon goal of a Martian landing and eventually colonization, we took a step back. We said, we think perhaps an orbital mission is most advantageous for both scientific study as well as eventual sorties to the surface and deciding which of the many locations our scientists globally would like to visit is a great place for a habitation location. Now the Deep Space Transport, or Mars Base Camp, is achievable within about a decade. It's all with the current funding profiles from NASA and our international partners with the technologies we have today. As Rob mentioned, we're leveraging a lot of what we've already created. We're leveraging the elements we are creating. We're reaching out to everybody commercially and internationally to participate. We're saying, let's go to Mars all together as humans. The NASA Authorization Act of 2017 asked us to go to Mars by 2033. Mars Base Camp allows us to achieve that mission. And we can accelerate it. Let's get there. Let's figure out where we want to land. And then let's actually go to the surface. Let's have somebody walk on the surface for the first time. So, you know, using the Mars orbital mission as the first mission allowed us to look at what are the ways to accomplish that mission quickly to meet that timeline that Danielle just talked about. And it pushes us to look at existing technologies. You know, when you talk about going to Mars, we're closer to Mars today than we were as a human race in the early 60s when we began the race to the moon. The technologies exist, and good news for a lot of us in the room as engineers, there's a lot of good engineering to accomplish, but we're not waiting for new technologies or new science that hasn't yet been invented. So let me walk you briefly through the elements of Mars Base Camp. Of course, the cornerstone for Mars Base Camp is the exploration command deck in the form of Orion. And I gave you the reasons earlier why that makes sense. Let me add one more. A lot of folks have talked about why carry a Mars heat shield, or a lot of the Orion heat shield all the way to Mars. And that's not to land on Mars. It's to give you that opportunity to do a direct entry to Earth on the way back. Obviously, we'd like to maintain and keep as much of this system when we come back to, to the uh, cislunar system as possible, reuse it for future missions. But if things aren't going well, knowing that you have the ability to come straight back to Earth, on that return, which is an invaluable early opportunity for safety in these early missions. Probably the most significant engineering development that remains is in the propulsion areas. 
We talk a lot about solar electric explosion, I'll touch on that in just a second, but we need high thrust, high efficiency propulsion in order to get the humans out to Mars in a timely fashion. It's still a thousand day journey for these types of missions, round trip, including the one year we get to, to spend in the Mars system. So this cryo propulsion stage, we're big fans, this is heresy I know, but we're big fans of box hydrogen, that method. Wherever we want to go, there's water, water can be breathed, water can be drunk, and water can be used for propulsion. And that ISP of hydrogen, the extra 100 seconds, is a huge gear ratio when you talk about exploring the solar system. Tucked inside those hydrogen and oxygen tanks and the crew quarters, this is 100% derived from the next step habitat work, the deep space gateway. And in fact, what we envision is the deep space gateway is the deep space transport. As we add more modules on, at some point we carve out and we head towards Mars. And so this provides the crew quarters, it provides that additional ecos capabilities all derived from the Orion systems. In the center are the cabs and labs. For those of you who are familiar with the SLS launch vehicle, these are just the universal staging adapter. We don't need to create new habitats. We don't need to create new habitat designs. We can utilize what we have in build today for SLS. So for electric propulsion, I think that's near and dear to a lot of the hearts of the folks in the room here. Slow, but very, very efficient to get our non-safety critical hardware out to Mars. And the cool thing about solar electric propulsion is that when you're done propelling, you've got an infrastructure in place for high voltage, high power, gathering, storage, and distribution. And that's invaluable when you start talking about 15,000 pounds of lab equipment and 40 kilowatts of in situ scientific research you can do from the Martian equipment. You gotta have your nodes, your cupolas, all of these exist today, both from ESA, from Japan, from Russia, even China, these are existing hardware elements that we can leverage to start our journey. And then finally, an excursion module. We're not going to have time to talk too much about details of the mission that Danielle's going to cover it in high level in just a moment, but it includes going to the moons of Mars to assess them. And that can be done relatively simple by just reconfiguring the Mars base camp. And that includes a small airlock and a couple of crawler devices which are just derived from man maneuvering units that we've had for decades now. So what can you do in a Martian orbit? What science can you achieve? It's actually quite a bit. It's probably more than the last 40 years combined. Like Rob mentioned, we'd like to know if Bobo and Deimos. Are they icy dust balls or are they dusty ice balls? Either way, it means we can use them for ISIU and get hydrogen, water, and oxygen. We also think that there's some of the Mars surface on those. We'd like to know more about how was Mars formed, how were we formed. Like Rob mentioned, the picture on the right, you can see what a man maneuvering unit looks like. For anybody that's been scuba diving, you know that when the silt comes up, it's really hard to see all the coral and fish. Well, it's the same thing on Phobos and Deimos. So they, they're spidery looking things that allow the scientists and astronauts to work on the surface of Phobos and Deimos while not disrupting all of the dust that surrounds them. When I say scientist astronauts, I really do mean it. You can see the picture of one of our scientist astronauts telerobotically operating something from the space station. Well, it's the same concept for Mars orbit. It's the same concept for lunar orbit. I don't know if anybody's had trouble or lost patience while their cell phone's loading. It takes 10 seconds to load a page. Can you imagine waiting 260 seconds at least to get a response from a rover from the surface of Mars all the way back to Earth? You can cut that time down significantly if you have somebody in orbit operating a rover on the surface. Now there's not a lot of Martian atmosphere, but there's enough for a UAV. You can also do aerial missions over Mars. Or you can do a sample return. We talked a lot about that yesterday. Sample returns are invaluable in terms of their science. Now, we provide 15,000 pounds or 1,600 kilos and 40 kilowatts of power in our labs. You can look at the samples there, or you can keep them pristine and bring them back to Earth. Either way, the science that Mars Base Camp provides is invaluable. The landmass, 
on the Martian surface is equivalent to the landmass on Earth, if you take away all the oceans. It's a lot of space to explore. We think Mars Base Camp allows us to gather for science and pick out the landing spots for our horizon goal of eventually settling on the surface of Mars. So would we pit the first Mars mission as an orbital mission to assess with the Lockheed? It offered us two things. First, how could we get there quickly? The answer is soon if you leverage the existing technologies to do the engineering required. And what could we accomplish there? It, it's unprecedented science. That ability to fly UAVs and drones and rovers with a quarter second of latency in big, fat, wide bandwidth allow those robots to become avatars for the scientists. And that's just not possible for that level of immersion from the Earth. You know, when you look at Mars, we all think it's small. We all know it's 3 h gravity. But the land mass of the whole planet is about the same as the land mass surface area of the Earth. Can you imagine trying to explore the entire land mass of Earth with rovers that can perhaps go from here to the back of the auditorium over a couple of days? But now picture UAVs and drones with global access of the entire Martian surface to allow you to get more science in one mission than you've gotten off of multiple missions in the past over many decades. But it doesn't end there. The concept behind Mars Base Camp is that it is exactly that. It's a base camp from which you then explore the system. And so it doesn't end in orbit. This is sort of novel concept number two. Our thinking is the first time you land on Mars isn't with large 30 or 40 or 50 metric tons of equipment and setting up that first habitat. Instead, you want to do penetrations to the Martian surface, sorties we call them. And so we've come up with a, a Martian reentry and ascent vehicle, again, with hydrogen and oxygen, not methane because it would fuel for orbit. This gives you through four, two to three weeks at several sites throughout the course of just one mission, giving you ground truth about where we can place humans as we move forward, allowing you to do sample returns and in situ field geology, if I can stretch the term. And if you do it right, it's just a derivative of the elements of Mars Base Camp itself. If you look in the lower left, that prior propulsion stage, along with Orion, is approximately the right size and mass and propellant loading that if you put that skin around it, you can use it for the sortie vehicle. And from orbit, it's about a five kilometer per second entry velocity. That's more like SR-71 or some of the hypersonic transports that we've been either flying or developing for decades here on Earth. You don't need the huge hypersonic inflatable decelerators Starting from Mars orbit, it's much easier to get to the surface. And so we see these as an opportunity for significantly understanding and getting initial human contact on the planet prior to actually settling down for the eventual habitats. Orion Command Module and into the 
the eyes and the soul of human beings, not robots, but humans, who can articulate that back and represent all of humanity here. That will be a transformational moment. And it will be followed by Mars landing and the first baby born on Mars and these other things for other generations, some of those perhaps in my generation. But this image is what I set my personal life to achieve. We'd like to leave you with an exhilarating sequence on what the next decade could look like in order to achieve this vision. Thank you so much.